So Israel, Hamas, Palestine, you're seeing what's going on there. Numbers being reported, what's taking place. Erdogan's coming out saying he's declaring Israel war criminals as Turkey rallies behind Hamas. We're seeing the protesting all over the place. You're seeing U.S. forces under fire in the Middle East as America slides towards brink. A defective uh, drone launched by an Iranian-backed militia targeted U.S. forces at the Erbil Air Base in Iraq but failed to detonate, mm. sparing, mm. Casual, sparing casualties. This incident was one of 40 drones and rocket attacks on U.S. troops by Iranian-backed militias in response to American support for Israel during the Gaza war. We, we can keep hearing about these stories. One open-ended question, what's your position with what's going on here? How would you, if you were the president right now, how would you put a stop to this? So, so say, there's, there's so much to talk about here. Uh, we got time, though. Absolutely. Yeah, we got time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we good. This isn't cable news. I like this. No, it's not. It's good. So there's no buzzer that goes off in 30 seconds? <laughs> no. You mean that? Okay. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and this is what uh, this is why this new media is important, by the way, is – they hate that I come on these kinds of, I mean, I go on all these podcasts. So something that we'll say here, here's how it works. Here's the game plays. Cable news does not like that you all exist. And so they create a disincentive for candidates like me to come on here. Why? They're going to take something I say here. Happens every time. Airlift it out of the context of the conversation that we're having. And then put it on the three minute or two minute version that they have or 30 second version that they have, which is their mode of media. And they know that that purposefully distorts what the candidate says, which creates a disincentive for candidates to actually engage in real human conversation. And that's why other people, even when they show up in podcasts, are coming in you know, stuff suits. That being said, let's talk about foreign policy because this is the third rail. So here's my view. My job as U.S. president is to look after the interests of Americans here in the homeland. I don't think that should be controversial, but that's my view. I think the job of Israel's president is to look after the citizens of Israel. And I think that we're an ally of Israel. And what do we do as an ally of Israel? I think it is to provide diplomatic support without military intervention. And so all of this stuff about sending this kind of aid or that, I think it's better for Israel and better for the United States if we mind our affairs and they mind theirs, but we give them the diplomatic support they need to say, you get to do whatever you need to to defend your homeland. I think that's what I said on the stage. I mean, you, I would if I was on the phone with Bibi, I'd tell him, you know what? If you need to smoke the terrorists at your southern border that are invading and threatening your country, you go do that. And I'm going to be smoking the terrorists that are trying to smoke this country on our southern border if they're entering here and attacking our country in the same way that they're attacking yours. That's what I'm going to do. You do you. And we'll give you the diplomatic support without the U.N. or anybody else second-guessing your decisions and micromanaging you or us micromanaging you. And I think that's part of the where we muddy the waters is when we give them some kind of check, but then we have to then become the backseat driver, the armchair quarterback, and then also have to assume and bear implicit responsibility for what does or doesn't happen. I don't think that's good for the U.S. and I don't think that's good for Israel. And actually, you know, I want people to understand this. The founding vision of Israel, the, the George Washington figure in Israel was a guy by the name of David Ben-Gurion. He was the founder of Israel. The whole premise in the founding of Israel, he said basically words to this effect. He was an eloquent man, about five feet tall, but a big man, a mighty man, who said, we don't want to depend on the sympathies of the West or anybody else or the United States or anybody else. I want a country where we will defend our own existence without depending on anybody else to do it. That was the premise of Israel. So I think that this whole idea, now as U.S. president, I think it's totally messed up that we're giving foreign aid to any country whose national debt per capita is less than ours. But from an even Israel perspective, that was the founding vision of Israel itself. So my view on here's what I would do is let Israel do whatever Israel needs to do to defend itself. My job as the U.S. is to look after American interests. We'll give them diplomatic support to be able to do that. But don't intervene militarily. And that makes it clear to Iran. So I can say publicly to Iran, you stay the hell out. And we'll stay out, and we'll let the IDF get its job done. In the meantime, because you read some of those headlines, if you hit us, the United States of America, if you hit our sons and daughters on military bases, our troops who are serving this country, if you actually hit them, we will hit you, whoever that is, whichever group that is, we will hit that group back, the person who actually hit us, 10 times harder. 
is against the backdrop of my view that we shouldn't be in places like Syria and Iraq in the first place. We were told we left Syria and Iraq. Now we find out we've got, what, a couple thousand people in places that we were told that we were left sitting there as sitting ducks and targets to get hit. So that shouldn't have been there in the first place, but I'm always pro-American here. If you hit us, we will hit you back. But what's interesting is there's also an interesting story. I don't know when Trump gave the speech. It was in Texas recently, I want to say, where he recounted, I think, an interesting story that went underreported. You guys could probably find it and pull it up at some point. Um, it was interesting where he told the story of after they took out Soleimani, the Iranians gave him a message or gave the you know White House a message that, hey, listen, we have to have pride here. We're going to hit back, but we're not actually going to hit you. We're going to send some missiles, but it's not going to hit anything. And that's exactly what happened. These are like very precise missiles they send up, and then they ex explode in the air without hitting their actual targets, when in fact these are very reliable, precise missiles. So in a certain sense, and that was interesting. It was fascinating. He, he hadn't told that story before. I hadn't, I mean, I think certainly the government hadn't told that story before. And so it's interesting where the responsible job of a U.S. president is to advance our interests, to be strong, to protect Americans. But it's not in our national interest to automatically sleepwalk our way into World War III. So for the people who are saying that because Iran funds you know, Hamas or Hezbollah or the Houthis or other groups, and those groups hit Israel, that that gives the U.S. a reason, like the Lindsey Grahams of the world that make this argument, to preemptively strike Iran. Think about that logic. According to that logic of proxy warfare, Russia would have the right to hit the United States now because we're funding Ukraine to hit Russia. So those messed up theories of proxy war, that's how you get to World War III. And I think it is a vital national interest. So we have this, we have this thing I rolled out the night before the debate. It's our no to neocons pledge. Actually, people should go there. We're not asking for money or anything else. Just sign the pledge if you're on board. No to neocons.com, okay? And every person who is a political appointee in my administration will have to sign it. Yeah, there's this. No, there's the no to neocons pledge. No to neocons.com. You go there. Look, just scroll down. This is not controversial stuff. If you scroll down to the three elements of this pledge, avoiding World War III is a vital national objective. Uh, I mean, maybe Nikki Haley agrees with me on that, disagrees with me on that, but I think most people will agree with me on that. <laughs> war is never a preference, only a necessity. Well, for those for whom war is a preference, you know, from Karl Rove to, you know, John Bolton sure. to yeah. Lindsey Graham to Nikki Haley, they will disagree on that. War is never a preference, only a necessity. Okay, that's number two. Number three is the sole duty of U.S. policymakers is to U.S. citizens. So again, these things should not be controversial, but I will require any political appointee in my administration to make sure they're aligned with these three elements of a basic foreign policy vision. But that's that's what puts me at odds how with close most of we? the Republican Party. Vivek, how close are we? I, you think know, you, you, I think we're closer than we've ever been in our lifetime, Patrick. In, in our lifetime. In our and lifetime. I, okay, I got you. And so, you know where you sit down and you, you run a company, you're like, okay, we're negotiating with XYZ. Uh, we want the price to be this. If we push a little too much, they may walk away. We don't want them to walk. We want them to stick around. How far do we want to go? What's the risk we want to do? And are you kind of making decisions? What could tip them off? What could cause them to do something? If you were to say... This could cause World War III. These three things could cause World War III. What would those things be? So I'll give you a couple, like, principle answers, and then I'll give you a couple fact answers. Sure. The principle answer, how you get to World War, is World War is rarely, it's, it's never in the interest of any of the countries who enter it. So that means you, it's a tripwire that accidentally forces a bunch of people into a situation that's not actually in their individual interest. You could call it a collective action problem. Here's how World Wars happen. Vague red lines. So when you don't know what somebody's actual red lines are, then you accidentally end up doing things that cross somebody's red line without knowing it. So my view is the U.S. has operated according to this model of strategic ambiguity. I think we need strategic clarity. Be crystal clear and mean it. As I said, if you hit us, including our sons and daughters who are troops, stationed wherever they are, we will hit you, not some other vague other actor. We will hit you 10 times harder. That's a clear red line. That's how you avoid world wars. Now, I think the other thing you got to look at is, is it my job 
to be a global policeman? If so, that, that, that's a clear path to world war because you have conflicts that don't relate to your self-interest. Or is it my path only to look after my self-interest? So if you start with the first premise that it's in everybody's, every nation's self-interest to avoid world war and every nation is only acting in their self-interest, then you avoid that world war scenario. So if you like this clip and you want to watch another one, click right here. And if you want to watch the entire podcast, click right here.